Greetings, greetings, greetings. Shalom, shalom, chabarim, and greetings to all viewers right here. So, why the Bible is a myth? We're going to call this one and title this one. Subject here is why the Bible is a myth to many. Yes, why the Bible is a myth to many. Is the Bible a myth? This is how most ones have asked, and there's a lot of debates concerning whether the Bible you know, what we call and what we know as the Bible nowadays, you know, putting everything in its proper context, whether the Bible is a myth. That's the question that others are asking in the debate and also, you know, those who say it's not, those who say it is. We're going to approach it like this. Why the Bible is a myth to many. This is how we want to subject matter this topic here why the bible is a myth to many not to all i'm not saying all not all not all not all but why the bible is a myth to many so do we think that the bible is a myth <clears throat> objectively speaking to many yes yes to many the bible is a myth well why is that well first of all let's define what a myth is Right? Because a lot of time we use words or words are used and we think we know the definition and the definition or the meaning of the word, what we think the word means is very subjective. That means from our own personal way that we feel or see it or have come to know this particular word. How many times you thought you knew a word and you thought this is the meaning of the word? Then you get to learn, oh, word? That's what the word really means? Oh, it doesn't really mean that? This is what we're speaking about with myth. So let's begin off right here with myth. with myth. One more time. Myth. Okay, a myth. What is a myth? So go from low degrees to high degrees here in our study. Right here we have the word myth. M Y T H. Right now, here the definitions is from the Oxford languages. Right? Let's start out from low degrees to high degrees. So we have right here myth is from the uh, Greek, I think this is the Koine Greek, the common Greek, mythos or mythos, mythos, mythos. The why in myth, it's a very interesting, you know, we look at the Greek right there, sometimes it has like a U sound, or sometimes it has like a, like kind of like a U or a Y, a Y-U, mute, mute, mythos, 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 you know, going back there. So then we get from the Greek, right, the Greco-Roman period, right, from the Greek we go to the Latin, the late Latin. Then we get to like the modern Latin, you can see how the word, how instead of having a U from the, we could say the more original, right, origin of the word from the Greek, we come to the modern Latin and we have M-Y-T-H-U-S. Now we scroll down right here and the word now comes to the mid-19th century. Mm. The mid-19th century is like the 1800s, just to point it out to ones and ones, just so we can have a kind of a context of time, right? Because we're coming from the so-called Greek, right? Mutos, mutos, and then to the late Latin and modern Latin, we have mythos, mythos. Remember the one was mutos, and now we have mythos, almost like tomato, tomato, so to speak. But this now comes down to us here in the popular you know, um, Western Gentile, times of the Gentiles, English as myth, right? Mid 19th century. So here it has this down here. So basically it gives us a basic, um, let's go down here, give us the basic, okay. Mid 19th century from modern Latin, mythos, via late Latin from Greek, mutos, mutos, right? So here you can see we already went ahead right here and Let's go to the etym online, right? Get to the etymology, right? One of the better, you know, sites for how they basically give some of the better de dictionary definition of the etymology, like, you know, how the word, you know, came into English, you know, been testified in whether English or other languages or how it was derived from other languages and got into English. But here's the main thing about etymology, how a word that we use today in a certain way didn't have the same meaning, right? We're looking at the same word today, but we're looking at it from a different meaning, 
while in the past it had a different meaning. So, for example, if we're looking at, like I said, the King James Version of the Bible, 400 plus year version of the Bible. There's many words in the King James Version that we read it today with the understanding, quote unquote, that we have today, but the word was used in a different way, right? A different way. So this, this would be a good exercise to actually go to some of those areas of scripture, right? Where the word has, there's, there's one word that's used and we use the word, like for example, I think it's prevent. Prevent is, is, is a very interesting word, like prevent and also let, let. Let has two ways. Let on one hand means to prevent and let in the next sense means to permit. Why? Because as we say the etymology, we get to recognize that at different times in the past, you know, because of so society and socialization, you know, like we use words today that 50 or 100 years ago, if people heard us speak, they, they wouldn't really know what we're talking about. Though we're speaking the same words or we're using the word in a different way. So I just put that right there, as we say, like on the beam of right there, just, you know, take note, take note. So here we have Etim Online. Right, for myth, we have 1830 from French myth, myth, right, for E at the end, 1888, and directly from modern Latin, mythos, mythos, right, from the Greek mythos or mythos, 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 right, and here's the meaning now. Now, here we're getting like to the earliest meaning of this term. Because you know how we use this term myth. We say, oh, that's a myth. That's not real. That's a myth. This is a myth. Oh, the Bible is a Bible a myth. This is why we say the Bible is a myth to many, right? So we're just making the argument here and just laying out some of the basic evidence, right? And then hopefully ones and ones, come, 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 make a reason on this, right? Share your comments, right? Like, share, and subscribe, right? So here, mythos has the meaning right from the greek right so we're going to the very root of this word that's come down to us as myth and the original meaning is speech thought word discourse conversation story saga tale myth uh, you see how they do this sometimes sometimes you ask like someone asks you what is this Right, and say, they say, well, this is this. Well, well, they didn't really explain what this is, so they throw so in myth right there. But here's the key. Here's the key of what a myth in its original or more archaic sense, anything delivered by word of mouth, right? And they say this is a word. Now note right here when they say it's a word of unknown origin. Now in our studies, right, there's a very interesting connection Right, of this particular word right here, myth, to what they call myth story or mystery. You know, there's this term used as mystery, you know, things that are mystery. Right? Now there's there's um at least two there's a duality of it, right? Some things that truly are what can be called mystery, right? And then we have this other thing called mystery. Right. You know, like nowadays there's like mystery, mystery novels, like like, for example, in the Western Gentile society, when you say mystery, right, what do you think of or what most ones might think of? They might think of mystery novels like Who Done It, you know, all those Who Done It novels, all those like Agatha Christie novels, you know, what I mean, you know, Nancy Drew and, and, and those other kind of like Sherlock Holmes, like Who, who, who Done It mystery masterpiece theater I used to watch that when i was growing up several decades ago you know masterpiece theater you know who done it a lot of who done it and it was called mystery mystery like masterpiece theater mysteries but all the mysteries were like who committed a crime and was trying to get away with it you know what i'm saying but now there was a different sense of what mystery meant even in the so-called biblical scriptural sense if you look in the bible and you look up the word mystery especially in the new testament now we have a, another sense of mystery that is more connected with the original sense of the word mystery and the root myth story so we're submitting to you mystery and its connection with myth story in a simple English speaking way and then we're going to show you we can show you the the coin of Greek we can go through the Greek and go through the linguistics and see the link right there 
right so right here we have anything delivered by word of mouth that is the most we could say original right oh, getting to the primary true word etymology so etymology means true word right so originally a myth am i talking about what we call myth today we're gonna we're gonna connect the dots right here right anything delivered by word of mouth a word of unknown origin now Beekes right finds it quote quite possibly pre-greek end quote now that's a good point right there right so this one scholar or academic researcher someone named Beekes or Beckis right he finds it according to what we have here in Etym online for myth as a noun quote quite possibly pre-greek end quote all right, so we already know that the Greeks, since we study history and even our story, you know how the Greeks learned a lot from, we could say, Kemet or Mitzrayim or Hetkapata, right, Egypta, Gibbets or Egypt, you know, and how they learned and incorporated a lot of things, you know, the Greco Roman period in Egypt, right? So when it says right here that Beekes finds it quite possibly pre Greek. So there's a lot of things that have been preserved, say, through other languages like the Greek language, but it's not originally Greek, but they picked up on it and they put it in their own way of saying and gave it within their own language a, a corresponding, you know, or at least a respective meaning, such as the case of Ethiopia and Ethiops. Ethiops is a classic, the Tobia, the Tob and Tobia connection. You know, hopefully we'll have the opportunity to do some print work, right? And also reveal in print work the connection of Ethiopia's uh, pre-Greek, right, origin, the Tob and the Tobia right there. But let's just focus right here on myth, right, just to make that point right there. And let's take note of this, Talmudim, disciples, anything delivered by word of mouth. Just note that right there. It begins off speech, a mythos was a speech, a thought, a word, a discourse, like a conversation, a story, a saga, a tale, they say myth, but getting to the root idea, anything delivered by word of mouth. And then they say, outside of the quotation, a word of unknown origin. That's why Beekes, Be Bekes finds it quite possibly pre-Greek. So that means this word doesn't really, it has come into Greek, it's used in Greek, and we know it in the Western Gentile, in this culture, latter-day, you know, Anglo-American culture. We know it, right, through the Greek, as we showed opening up with the etymological tree. But let's go down here. This we find to be very interesting. Now, this now brings us more from the past, right, then looking at what we can call the, quote, origins or at least as close as we can get to the origins with some available evidence right so here it says myths are quote stories about divine beings all right now just to note this right here this is a quote here from j simpson and s rude quote dictionary of english folklore oxford 2000 on page 254 all right just want to share this right here on myth all right this is our initial, this is our opening, you know, like the opening argument or opening presentation, all right? Myths are, quote, said to be, quote, stories about divine beings generally arranged in a coherent system. They are revered as true and sacred. They are endorsed by rulers and priests and closely linked to religion. Once this link is broken, and the actors in the story are not regarded as gods, but as human heroes, giants, or fairies. It is no longer a myth, but a folklore. I said folk tale. Slika, right? Again, it is no longer a myth, but a folk tale. I thought that was interesting. Once again, that last line. Once this link is broken. Once this what? This link is broken. What you think about that? What you think? Once this link is broken, the actors in the story are not regarded as gods, but as human heroes, giants, or fairies. It is no longer a myth, but a folk tale. Now, this is interesting. So, therefore, 
what this is demonstrating is there's the difference between something being a myth and something being a folk tale, right? Last line here says, where the central actor is divine, but the story is trivial. Again, where the central actor is divine, but the story is trivial. The result is religious legend, not myth. This is, that's interesting. It's an interesting kind of a definition here in J. Simpson and S. Rood's A Dictionary of English Folklore, Oxford 2000 on page 254, where the central actor is divine, but the story, the narrative, the story is trivial, trivial, trife, trivial. The result is religious legend and not myth or mythos. So I have a question here. Ancient Kemet, Hekapita, Hekapita, Egypta, right? Mitzrayim, Kemet, right? Was that myth? Do, you, do we see how some of this can also be applied there, right? Especially the first part of this definition, right? Of myth, right? But remember, we're now bringing this word from its original, what it originally meant, right? Anything that is what? It says anything delivered by word of mouth, right? Anything delivered by word of mouth. And here it says these are stories about divine beings generally arranged in a coherent system. They are revered as true and sacred. They are endorsed by rulers and priests, right? Rulers and priests and closely linked to religion. Now, not to get into argument over that particular word, did he could have said, they could have said spirituality slash religion or religion and spirituality, but the part about once this link is broken, right? Now we can, when I'm reading this here, I'm thinking about my studies and our studies here in ancient Egypt as well, like what has happened. Our objective, right? We're seeking to objectively. Now we're gonna explain that hopefully when we get into the word myth right here from the scripture in the Bible, because a very interesting connection we have in the scripture in the bible you know concerning this whole idea of myth because it seems as though in the king james version of the bible like some people say that the bible is myth but that's because of well why is the bible a myth to many that's that, that's our question right there the last line right here we want to share from etim online is the last line right there says general sense general sense of quote untrue story now we went from the original meaning anything, you know, delivered by word of mouth, then into the stories and these narratives, you know, about divine beings, you know, revered as true and sacred, endorsed by rulers and priests, and closely linked to, you say, religion or their spirituality, but then these links being broken, right? The links being broken is the fall of Kemet. Kemet, just, just for example, just within this narrative here and within this particular word because we don't look at the word myth to be a bad word all right especially when you have the knowledge of the meaning of the word and see the words have dualities to it all right and this latter day time we're in a particular we got one side right one side of the proverbial coin right so here we're like flipping the coin and allowing one to see the other side of the coin and so we're labeling this not is the Bible myth and give thanks for those who are reasoning on that subject matter. But we're saying why, why the Bible is a myth, right? Or is myth to many or to the many. Maybe you say it like that, to the many. Because now the general sense that we have today of myth, when somebody says something's a myth, what do you think of? You think of an untrue story, a rumor, something imaginary, or a fictitious object or individual. Oh, such and such, oh, that's a myth. Oh, oh, he or she is a myth, or the Bible is a myth. So what you're saying by that is that the Bible is an untrue story, it's a rumor, it's imaginary, it's fictitious object or individual. And here's the key thing, that this general sense, right, the general sense, this is like the mass, what do you call it, mass, um, you know, mass, uh, um, almost like mass delusion, right, like mass delusion, the general sense. So basically, most people in the public, this is what they believe a myth is, right? 
I'm talking about people who have gone to college and schools and they studied. And I thought when you study, you're seeking to find the truth. So to find the truth is that, yes, the word myth does mean today, especially since 1840, an untrue story, a rumor, imaginary, fictitious object or individual. Yes, it doesn't, doesn't mean something that is not true or make-believe or made up. Yes. That's why I said that the Bible is a myth to many, right? But what's the reason why? So the first thing we had to do right here is kind of just lay down, you know, the basic, we say the roots of the word myth, right? The basic roots of the word myth, you know, like if you do from a, a secular, you know, like a secular study. You can see we started this out all online, you know, using the online links. We're here at Etim Online. We went to the Google, the Oxford, you know, to show the descent of it from its original meaning. Now, we've established this, that the, at least the original point of reference of the word myth that we know today, it traces all the way to Greek. And there is a, how can we say, there is um, an allegation that it's likely that the roots of this word is pre-Greek. And we would say it is. In fact, the word mystery Right, the true roots is really Hebraic. It's really Hebrew or Afro-Semitic. We can prove that. Right, the word mistatir in the Hebrew, mistatir. Anybody speak Hebrew? Mistatir, mistatir, mistatir. Mysteries from satar, something that is something that's hidden, like a confidential. You know, like you only reveal your mysteries or your confidentials. To who do you reveal your confidentials or your mysteries? Right. If you're a wise person, you reveal your confidentials or your mysteries, right, to people whom you trust, right? So this is the first part of it right here, right? Just, just give me a moment. Now, now, brothers and sisters, and I'd like you to note that we're saying that the Bible, we didn't say the Torah, right? We didn't say the Nabim. The Nabiyaim, Nabim, the prophets. We didn't say the Ketubim or the uh, Megillot. You know what I mean? We didn't say the Brit Hayashana or the Brit Hadasha. In other words, we didn't say it was the Torah. We didn't say it was the prophets or the Tehillim, the Psalms, or you know, or the um, the writings like the wisdom books. You know, we're saying the Bible. Right? And when we say the Bible, we're putting it especially within this 400 plus year period of context. Right? This is where the Bible really has become a myth within the bad sense or that general sense from 1840 that we showed you. Right? In that bad sense, that negative sense, and that bad sense of the word. Right? The bad sense of the word. The Bible has become a myth to many. Now, for the reasons why the Bible is a myth to the many... Let's hear first now, let's get a little bit deeper than the Etim online and then the basic uh, Google etymological search. That's like, that's like, like a basic general, right? That's always like a basic a general perspective so we can put it into general context. So here, let's come out of this right here and let's go into this right here. Let's go to my sword. Now here we already went ahead, right? And what we did, first we looked up fables, right? We looked up the word fables. Because we had come across this study some years ago, right? When we were seeking to um, bottom out, what, you know, the meaning of myth, of mythos, right? Mythos. We, we often use the term like the Hebrew mythos. You might hear some ones and ones on the podcast, the audibles. This is some of the older audibles, but often we will use this terminology of the Hebrew mythos. Right? We may talk about the comedic mythos. Right? There are different mythos. Right? We could talk about the American mythos. Right? We as black people, generally speaking, have mythos too. Right? And what is the mythos? Well, anything that's delivered by word of mouth. Right? So now we know that some word of mouth can be true and some word of mouth can be untrue. Right? So how do we distinguish between word of mouth that's true or untrue? How do we distinguish between the Bible being a, a, a myth to us and, and let's put it like this a myth in the negative sense a myth in the like untrue myth why the bible is a i was i said i said a myth to the many right a myth 
an untrue myth to the many. Well, I'm going to keep the general title there, but here we're getting into some of the details. Why did I say this? Because we already recognize in just our cursory investigation to the etymology of myth that the origins or the more etymologically um, pre, you know, pre scribed meaning was different, is different than the meaning we get today, right? But here we have to first focus on what does the Bible say about myth? Now the word myth doesn't really appear, right, in the Bible in the sense of how we spell it, M-Y-T-H. Remember, it's a Greek word. So here we're going to focus on the Brit Chadash, the, the Hadish Kidan, the Adish Kidan, the New Testament, the New Covenant, the Renewed Covenant. So here we have first um Timothy 1 and 4 and here this is um, Rabbi Shaul aka the Apostle to the Gentiles known as the Apostle Paulos, Paul he's saying to his disciple Timothy neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies that minister questions rather than godly edifying that is in faith so do so now here in 1 Timothy chapter one verse four. Paul, right, from we would say the Yehudi, from a, a a true Jew or Hebrew tradition, and the principles, right, is giving good instruction. This is why we often highlight the fact that the one known as Apostle Paul, right, even according to the New Testament, is actually a rabbi, right. He's actually a rabbi. When we say the rabbi, he's one of the well, he was a bad, but then he became, he was converted, he became good. Now, I know some folks, you know, that's a whole other conversation right there, right? But that's just the reality. As His Majesty says, we all know what sort of person Paul was, you know what I mean? But he kind of turned his life around, let's put it like that, because of the truth, right? But the discipline that he had, right, reminds me of the discipline that Robeno Yeshua, Right? Our rabbi, the rabbi of rabbis, Yeshua HaMoshiach, as well. Now, you have to note this here. Sometimes we generalize too much. This is why when we're saying that the Bible is a myth to the many, we're not saying that the Bible is a myth. See, a lot of people do that because really they can't take ownership of the fact that the Bible is a myth to them. But what sort of a myth is it? Right? What sort of a myth is it? Now, to the many, as we're stating in this, it's a myth in the untrue sense. Right? It's like what Paul is saying, Paulos is saying right here, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies that minister questions rather than godly edifying that is in faith. Now, of course, you might hear and read, I don't read it like the witch, but that, you know? But now, let's go right here, right? That, whatsoever, whosoever, whatsoever, whosoever, okay? Whosoever minister, that ministers. Right? So what Paul is saying here, he said, don't give heed to fables and endless genealogies that do something. And what do these sort of fables and endless genealogies do? They minister questions. Right? Or right here, they reach forward, they supply questions. What well, it says right there, they hold, they afford, furnish, they be occasion of questions. Right? Questions in the sense of, right, um, zetasis. Seeking inquiry, debate, controversy, right, searching, right, dispute. But it's now putting the questions in not as a positive sense necessarily, but in a negative sense. Questions like, like you question yourself, you doubting yourself, you almost like you second guessing, right? You second guessing yourself, right? So here, that's the context of it. But let's zoom in on the word fables. Now, as you can see, we already have it highlighted, the G3454. When we bring up in that word, look what we find. We find the word myth. There's the word myth right there. The word myth in the Bible. So now, is the Bible really, is the scriptures really a myth and true in reality, objectively speaking? No. Right? As what it is. Now, subjectively speaking, Yes, it's a myth to the many, right? Subjectively, one looking from their own personal perspective, right? With their limitations and ignorances, right? But looking at it from an objective perspective, not just the way I might see it, right? But the way that it is properly when you weigh it, 
is properly seen based on the evidence, based on the facts. So here we have the G3454 Muthos. Right? This is Muthos, 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 Muthos. Right? And Thea definition says a speech, a word, a saying. So now, if is a speech, a word, a saying a bad thing? If you was to answer that honestly, how would you answer that? Is a speech, a word, a saying a bad thing? I think a proper answer would be, it all depends, right? It all depends, right? In principle, no, but in, 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 in you know, like in principle, but in personality, you know, like we say in personality, well, yeah, it could be. Somebody may give a bad speech or say a bad word or deliver a bad saying, right? So the word just means a narrative, a story, right? Right? You see when the first definition says, the first entry under a narrative story, it says true narrative. You see the secondary one says a fiction, a fable. So that has more to do in this context with the viewer. Not to get into physics, but it's like how it said that in physics, right, um, what is viewed is affected by the viewer. Right? Just a basic principle, not get into all the details, but that's not what they said physics is force and form physics right that what we view in physics right you know that which is viewed is affected by the viewer right so it's like they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder to me this might look good right to you it doesn't look good right but now maybe we need to check our eyes as they would say <laughs> you know if it's truly something that's beautiful but it's not seen that way you know what I mean it's a matter of how we see it Right? It's a matter of what sort of an eye we see it, right? what sort of an ear, how we hear. Right? As Robeno Yeshua said, take heed to how you hear. So basically, a fable. Now, when we read it in King James Version, you hear fable, you're like, oh, see what it says, fable fiction. But notice, that's the B definition. According to Thayer definition, right? that's the B definition under a narrative story. What kind of a narrative story? A fictional narrative story. A, a, a story that's a fable. But do you see the A? The A says a true narrative. Right? So now when we're reading this here to put it into context, neither, neither, right? that, that, that tells you a lot. Thea. That's the context, like when you're reading comprehension. Neither, neither give heed right, to fictional narratives, right? to, to fables, to, to, to false narratives. Right? and to endless genealogies that only minister questions like dubious doubts, you know, questions, uncertainties, rather than godly edifying. And edifying right there means, right, what? Oikodomia. Oikodomia, what is that? that? It's the act of building, right? Instead of building, you know, instead of building on what we are able to know and what is true. Don't give heed to these fictional stories, these fictional fables. In other words, I would say to ones and ones, based on the title here, right, um, why the Bible is a myth to many, you have to cut off all that you've heard from counterfeit Christianity. You, you, have, you have to cut off all that and all the false imagery too, right? You have to, like we said, like be born again. You have to cut that off, right? And we're going to prove it here. But just here, just to put us in the context, what is edifying? Edifying is building, right? Like when we talk about building, confirmation, right? Edifying, building, this noun feminine, building, right? Building, that is in the faith, right? That is in the faith, the peace, these, right? The conviction of the truth, right? What we are convicted by. Because now when we hear this question circulating, it's like a lot of people that might have had a little bit of um, um, conviction in the truth, or even true principles concerning the Bible, right, are doubting it because they're hearing all this myth, myth, it's a myth, the Bible's a myth, it's not true, it's a fictional tale. And that's only in the perspective that they're approaching it. Because look, we're looking at a translation here. Note, you note, note that? We're looking at a translation here. Now, there are actually five verses that is all the same word myth. All right, let's go through the five verses here quickly. First Timothy 4 and 7, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather to godliness. Now, of course, some people hear the old wives. Mm, the, the, what's the next charge? Accusation is going to be leveled against the translation of the, of the scripture. Right? The King James translation. Next, 
One is misogyny. Oh, how do you say? Oh, wives. But then as I got into this, I don't know if we have time right here to get into it, but as I got into the word, oh, wives, it, it wasn't even saying, oh, wives. It, in, even in the coin of Greek, it's using the same part of the word old, right? In fact, this will go right here. Oh, right? Gra old days, right? Gra old days, right? Thayer says, the old womanish, old wives, old woman, right? Right? But you see, it's from grouse. They say, old woman, right? So you see grouse here, old woman. And the G1491, right? Eidos, Eidos, Eidos. What is Eidos? Eidos is the external, outward, appearance, form, figure, shape, right? Now, we're going to say, well, what about the old wives, right? It's saying like from an old way, you know, an old wisdom. Because the wife, you know, a woman in scripture, principally, right, is wisdom. Now, if it's a good woman, it's good wisdom. If it's a bad woman, it's a bad wisdom. It's like if a man, right? If it's a good man, he's motivating on a good gnosis, a good knowledge, a good da'at. You know what I mean? A good science, scientia, scientia. But if he's a bad man, he's operating on either ignorance or pseudoscience or, or bad knowledge or, or no knowledge at all, right? So this is how we interpret. And let's just go on right here. Just want to just bring this out because we saw this. And you can see where it's from a view, a form, appearance, right? You see with the word right here, like an old appearance, the old appearance, the old way of viewing it, my, the old way of viewing it, or these, these so-called bad mythos, right? These bad mythos, right? You see what I'm saying? The bad mythos. Remember, the whole tree was, you know, the knowledge of good from evil so this is where discernment comes in so we have to discern as we look into the scripture otherwise we're caught up on the very thing that the bible or the scripture the new testament and paul here is warning us of right so it's showing us that the word myth right can be used in a twofold sense let's go to second timothy four and four he uses this word a lot when he's communicating to timothy at least three times in timothy right his disciple and they shall turn away their ears from the truth Right. What's the word truth in the in the coin of Greek? The G two two five hundred, the two hundred twenty fifth. Right, <laughs> King, the King of Kings two two five. That's the Althea. What's the Al, Al Alethea? Right, the Alethea. Right, Alethea. Right, Alethea. Look what we have. The Alethea. Right, we have objectively, objectively. So you hear us talk about the objective perspective or being objectively from an objective point of view, putting an objective face, right? That's what is true in any matter under consideration. This means that if I'm reasoning with ones who are saying that the Bible is a myth, right, and say from my view, right, I don't see objectively speaking the Bible as a myth for I. But if I understand the subject matter well enough, I can understand that many people get caught up, right, on the fakery, on the flim flam, right, of the same thing. You know, like something can be true, right, but it can be viewed as untrue, right, and that's been taught by tradition, especially over this 400 years. You know, like the whitewashing, when we go back and look over periods of time, pictures were black and they whitewashed them and a lot of little mixed up and a lot of little lies and everything. So when somebody says, oh, woo, 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 Christianity, we recognize what they mean by that, right? Even though my view, my objectively speaking, might be different than that. If I'm looking at the whole thing and, and like this is give righteous judgment, that's righteously looking, weighing on the scale. And even if I don't see it that way, if I recognize others do see it that way, that's the reality. They see it that way, all right? It's not an effort to change the way they see it, but to acknowledge that's the fact, right? Objectively speaking, aletheia, right? They turn away from what is true in any matter under consideration. So, you know, sometimes people in religion, right, or moving from a overzealous, right? You know, have a zeal, right, but lacking that gnosis, lacking that knowledge, right, of what is true, what's in reality, right? What is true in things pertaining to Elohim and the duties of man. So we have different contexts of how what is true can be applied. Why what is true can be applied. And then, then there's the subjective side of truth. 
all right? But you see, what happens is that most people put forward their subjective view, like their personal idios, ideos. That's where we get the word idiot from. This is the word we're in right now. Well, this is the area where we're going to show you that word, right? We're going to show you that word. That word was in the, the one old wives. We didn't go deep enough in there. Well, we might have to return to that just to bring it out, put the proof before you, and you can hopefully study it if you're interested in finding out more of it, the truth for yourself. But the truth as a personal excellence. So what happens is that we have to look at things outside, so to speak, of ourselves, things we're viewing, objectively speaking. Right? And then after we find what the truth of that matter is objective, right? then see what we can receive subjectively. But what happens is that people look at things subjectively and they're just viewing it from appearance or from tradition, how they've been told, right? And the key thing is they have not been initiated in the truth. See, there's an order. This is what we find here even in the dialogue between Paul and Timothy, right? In the three letters, epistles that we already just cited the word fable which the underlying word is muthos which is the word myth right and remember myth now has a has a positive sense right and myth can have a negative sense it's like somebody can tell you a story can tell you a narrative say something to you right it'll give you a word and it could be a true word or it can be a false word we need the discernment to know the difference so that candor of mind which is free from affection pretense simulation falsehood and deceit that means that when we do look at something subjectively in the realms of truth in the realms of truth we're not adding what we feel about it right or or, or pretense or a simulation or falsehood or deceit Right? Because then that affects our path, our walk, right? our fulfillment. Right? So here we have this where it says, and shall be turned to fables. So many turn their ears. Now the ear is very important. Mystically speaking, the ears. They turn their ears from the truth. Both the truth in its objective sense. Right? The first perspective of truth should always be objectively. Right? That means that even if somebody says something to me and I'm wrong, and I recognize in my mind's eye I'm wrong, it's not to subjectively make excuses. Right? It's to recognize that truth. Right? Or to feel a way or try to dismiss it. You see, but this requires a discipline of the mind, as his Majesty teach I and I discipline of the mind. Right? It's a basic ingredient of general morality and therefore spiritual strength. In order to follow its aim, one must be guided by the hymenote, the living faith. Now, Titus and Peter, right? Peter has one place and one more place for Paul. He says, not giving heed to Jewish, Yehudi. Uh-oh. He's saying that there are Yehudi or there are Judaic fables. And the underlying word fables is muthos. And muthos, we have it once again is a speech, word, saying. It could be a narrative, a story. It can be a true narrative, or it can be a fictional fable. It can be an invention, and therefore a falsehood. So looking at the context here, Paul is advising. Remember, Paul already, he says elsewhere in the epistles, he identifies himself as an Israelite, as a Hebrew, as a Yehudi. He says, we are Yehudi by nature, not sinners of the Gentiles, right, of the tribe of Benjamin. Right? And so he's clear on his identity and how his people, we, right, once lost, now found, have gone astray. And he even testifies how he too had gone astray. And through that grace of Robenu, so forth and so on, you have it in the, you know, in Acts of the Apostles. But here in Titus, he's saying, not giving heed to Yehudi fables. So even amongst the Yehudi or the Jews, or we could say even amongst our own people, own selves, we can have our own fables. Even as Rastafari, there may be certain things that are fables or myths, right? But not really true, but they are myths. Now, remember we said that duality there, it can be a good, right? It can be something that is good or, 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 or a true narrative, but a mythos. Or it can be a false, like what we say about that the lion crowned the king, 
right? Like in the, in the coronation of the King Messiah, in the Mahalasalasi, like the lion crowned the king. Well, well, what lion crowned the king? Was it really a physical lion? And me and I and I, brethren, over the years, over the decades, have reasoned on that. Some very interesting reasonings, you know, on that, you know? But here it says, not giving heed to Jewish Yehudi fables and commandments of men. Because some people will read this here in Titus 1 and 14 and say, see, that's why I don't deal with the Torah. I don't, I don't deal with the Old Testament or whatnot like that, the Hebrew scripture, because the Jewish scripture could have, see, here in Titus 1 and 14. See, counterfeit Christianity preaches like that, right? Because they don't know the truth, right? Here, Paul, who is a Yehudi and proud to be a Yehudi and an Israelite, right, in matters concerning the truth and the covenant, right, is saying to his disciple, Beware, don't give heed to these Yehudi fables, these mythos, in other words, these false narratives and commandments of men. See, he didn't say commandments. See, that's Yahweh's, right? That's the scripts right there, right? That's Ha Torah. But he's talking about that men and people now have inserted their own commandments alongside and instead of Hakados Baruchu Yahweh. Jehovah's commandments and this is what turns ones from the same word truth from the ability to look at it truly from a objective and a subjective like we said that balance objective and subjective perspective right second Peter 1 and 16 it says for we have not followed cunningly devised fables so here in second Petro Peter Kepha is saying that we, so he's speaking for the Nazarenes, right? In truth, the Nazarenes, but they were being named called as Christian or as Christians, but they identified themselves as Nazarenes, right? Because of Yeshua HaNotzri, Jesus of Nazareth. But he's saying that speaking for the community, especially for, we could say, the, the um, Yehudi, the Hebrew, or the Israelitish Messianics, because remember, P Paul was sent to the, the Gentiles, you know, as it was, especially the Hebrews and the Jews among the Gentiles and other righteous amongst the Gentiles and Peter amongst those of the circumcision, the Yehudi. And he's saying that we have not followed cunningly devised fables, right? Notice how Peter now articulates it, brings it out as cunningly devised, why right? Sophizo, why right? To make wise, to teach, to invent, to play the sophist, but in the sense of to devise cleverly or cunningly right right to render but it's in a sinister sense right that is continue plausible error you see that right there continue plausible error my right? cunningly devised continue plausible error so there were some mythos and narratives and those of us who've been studying right and going through a lot of ancient hebrew israelite yehudi judaic writings and other things that midrash so forth and so on we can see that for ourselves right you know and this this word of wisdom becomes very important but he says when we made known to you the power and the coming of adonai yeshua hamoshiach we made known to you the power and the coming but were eyewitnesses of his majesty so they're saying that we didn't make this up. This is not some myth that we just made up. Now you hear folks saying today that, well, that was a myth, right? They, they say today, and already this is, ain't nothing new under the sun. One try to claim it because it was something they did not witness. They did not see, right? And they were seeing it from their own perspective. Go back to the old wives right there, right? The old wives, that old wisdom. You know, notice it's sophist. Right, we have Edel, Edos, Edos, or Edos. Right now, it's the G1492. Look at that, and that's from Ido or Edo. Edo means to see. Ah, oh, there we go. The eye, the eye. Right, remember, even Haru Horus had lost his eye <laughs> in that comedic mythos. Right, look to see, to perceive with the eyes. Notice, they didn't say just the eye, but the eyes to perceive by the senses, sense perception, right? What things might seem to be, right? Like if something miraculous happened to me, and I say, wow, you, look how I was being this miraculous way, and I called him named Yah, and when I called him named Yah, I was delivered out of it. You might say, oh, this guy is in a religious myth. He, he, uh, he's just making up stuff because he's trying to get a convert. I'm just testifying to the truth because you didn't experience it. 
you know you ever experienced something and try to tell someone else about it and they didn't want to believe you or accept it and they thought you were just making stuff up and then they experience the same thing and it's a whole different story see to perceive with the eyes to perceive by the senses to perceive to notice to discern to discover that means that one has to have this their own you know experience so well, we have something experiential to turn the eyes the mind look what it says the mind the attention to anything so it's not even just seeing it begins with the with like the the senses or the outer senses because the word previously external right but as we trace it to the root right there's a good root here right to pay attention to observe to see about something to ascertain what must be done about it to inspect to examine you see right here to examine to know right now this word comes down right here right to the basic sense of to see and it's from this word right here is it here is it here right you see what it says up right up uh tanomai like like optometrist you know you go to get your eyes checked as it were <laughs> you know but this word here edo right and even the word before it right here right edos is where we get idiots from you know when people call people idiots originally idiot meant that somebody saw things only from their own perspective they in other words they were only subjective they could not or would not be objective mm -hmm. imagine you go to before a judge for your case and your judge is a subjective judge this is what's happened right miscarriages of justice because somebody is approaching right something and not from an objective perspective you know not with like a balanced eye right so that's what it meant right here when it says oh wives fables because remember the woman principle right has to do with that old wisdom right that old wisdom you know what I mean because wisdom is renewed you know what I mean wisdom is renewed right you know we can learn from principles of the past but there's always new applications right of those principles principle over personality so don't think we're talking about any particular old woman here you see what I'm saying just like when we talk about a bad man one who's not a bad man should not feel no way about it right so old wives fables right you know old wives fables or mythos right and to exercise oneself right to godliness but see here's a pun the old wives that that Paul is talking about to his disciple Timothy right he's speaking about those um those uh like Pharisees and scribes and others you see it's like in this first one right here where it says neither give heed to fables these false narratives and endless genealogies right that basically is just like rambling a lot about nothing right instead right rather to you know edifying to building up in the power that is in the emuna, the imnet the hymenon we could say the amen from the hebrew perspective that admittance admitting as true right and therefore manifesting right in and through what we do right so here let's look at this right here muthos we just briefly address this right muthos let's go down here now notice where it says the origin they say perhaps is from the same idea as the g3453 and they say through the idea of tuition 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 think about that for a moment tuition well we didn't say intuition but 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 notice how close these words are you ever peep that intuition and then you have tuition well I went to school I had to pay tuition right but in school I learned to have intuition <laughs> you know so we have this word here they say perhaps the same as through the idea of tuition right a tale that is fiction right quote myth a fable right but let's go deeper let's go deeper so here we go to the G3453 and here is the reason why this now brings us to the why why is the Bible a myth to the many right it all goes back to the fact of what the Bible is the Bible is a we're not saying the Bible is a closed book but there is um, an order of revelation right you remember when 
the Ethiopian um, official called the Ethiopian eunuch is reading the scroll of Yeshaya. Now we know he's a Hebrew, he's a black Jew from Ethiopia because he went to Jerusalem to worship. Right now, as he was returning, he got a scroll of the uh, prophet Yeshaya, Yeshayahu, Isaiah, Isaiah, and he's reading that scroll. And then Philip is told to join his chariot, and he joins his chariot, right? And he hears him reading. And what's the first question? And this is the real Hebraic Yehudi kind of conversation here that they have, that we have in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. He says, My friend, do you understand what you're reading? He said, How can I unless some man guide I? That's the key right there. You see, because people are relying on deep ending and they're getting in the deep end. It's almost like if one doesn't really know how to swim very well, right? And you jump in the deep end of the water, what's gonna happen? If you don't know how to swim very well or at all and you jump in some deep water, I mean, usually when ones go out to swim, what happens? They put you in maybe some shallow water, right? And you know what I mean? Just giving that kind of analogy right there. But understand the analogy in this context most ones, right, especially in this Anglo-American world system, empire, 1611, 400 year KJV version world system, most ones and ones, need I now say white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, right, most ones and ones have been given the white Anglo-Saxon counterfeit Christian myth. Christianity, by and large, not all, not all, not all, but by and large, as it is practiced, or rather as it is malpracticed, right, is that mythology that is that fictional, right, that fable, that fictional narrative, that fictional fable, that fictional narrative right there, right, that has distracted so many Christians from the true manifestation of the tenets of their faith. Have you noticed this is this is this is a, a, a so-called critique, right? That's often leveled by ones who are not Christians or non-Christians to Christians, right? But it's probably one of the few critiques that has really some Christian merit when they say, "Well, how come these Christians, right, believing what they believe?" Right, and yet the majority of people in the world, well, a good, a good majority, right, of people in the world over like 400 years had become or professed Christians. I mean, you could go back to the ones that had actually, we could say, effectively made most other people counterfeit Christians, and that's the white people, right? See, a lot of us, even as black people, have to be rec recognized. I think our ancestors recognize it. This is why when they took the faith to themselves, Right? It was a different form of faith or religion. Originally, when black people took to the Bible and Christianity, we had something that was revolutionary. You know, something that was revolutionary, something that was militant, something that for the community was healthy and productive. Right? But then, of course, something happened. Right? But that's a whole other matter right there. But let's just touch on this right here because here we're getting to the main point. And I know sometimes the tension, sometimes our videos can be a little long. And sometimes we look at how long ones and ones engage, you know, and maybe they have to do other things. But to get to it right here. So getting to the root of the word mythos. Basically what a mythos is on a certain level, right? A mythos is on a certain level like the parables in Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 13. Go to Matthew chapter 13, my fellow Talmudim, my fellow disciples. In chapter 13, Yeshua HaMoshiach is initiating his disciples into the mis mysteries, right? what's called the mysteries, the mistatir, mistatiroch, right? the mysteries, mistir. Right? Now, as we said, the word mystery, right? and we can prove this in the Hebrew, right? and it also connects with the whole theme right here. A mystery is a... Is Elohim's confidential. It's like the Almighty's confidential. Or, or even we could say secret. Right? And therefore, even from the earliest days, we can go back to Moshe and the Israelites and even the very fountain of the Hebrew revelation, right, in the scripture, right? And see it was a part of an initiation. Right? See, people think like, okay, like people a person can just pick up the Bible, right, and they can figure it out. 
No, they kind of figure out their own many times. Not all, not all the time, but many times their own delusion. Why? Right? Because what Philip said to the Ethiopian official in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, my friend, do you understand what you're reading? It's obvious that when we continue reading, we find that the Ethiopian official, the Ethiopian black Jew, he did know, like he, he did have an idea, but, but, but still he humbled himself to say, how can I unless some man guide me? So now here we're at the word mu'eo. Mu'eo, let's just close this up for a moment. Mu'eo is at the root of muthos, right? And you can see muthos right here is where we get the word myth, right? Here's the Greek as we began off with the etym online, right? Now we're putting it into context with the very book that we're speaking about the Bible. But here we're going beyond like the, the web page. We're peeling back the web page and we're going into we're getting into the source code. Right? Here we're going to the very source code. Right? And going to the source code here in the New Testament, going to the, the Greek. Right? And then we're tracing the Greek words and all linguists and academics that study linguists, like the language of it, understand why this is so important a process right, of study, even from an academic point of view. But here's what, that this is the same way that we we'll say that we as Yehudi, even we the black Jews of the line of the tribe of Judah and even other Yehudim, right, study. Right? This is how we, we study. This is a part of Let's get to the next word right here. Let's get to this word right here. This is a part of the mueo. And mueo is defined as, right, as, so you can see that part of it. The first definition is to initiate into the mysteries. Now we have that with Robeno, our rabbi, because he's our rabbi and we're his Talmudim, his disciples, right? And he says, you know, ye worship, y'all worship that which you know not. We know what we worship. Right? For salvation, Yeshua, right? Yeshua is of the Yehudim, is of the Jews. Because there was a certain order of discipline. And this order of discipline, the principles of it is not just unique to the Hebrews or to the Yehudim, the Jews, the Judahites of even that first century. Right? But there are principles in even other, we could say, muthos or mythos, even in ancient Kemet and, and in Assyria and other parts of the world, even in Asia, parts of Asia, even in the Americas. We know that there are rites of passage, there are initiations, you know what I mean? There's that thinning of the herd, who is really, you know, worthy right, for this, who, who really is seeking this? You see what I'm saying? It doesn't mean that they are refused any good from, we could say, like the scripture, but one's just, just stumbling around in the scripture. See, in the ancient times, uh, like th there's a convenience to having the whole Bible, right? Because people say, well, if you got the Bible, you can just read it yourself. But I don't know how many people, I never took a count. I never knew that that was something I should be counting. But there were so many ones that I've spoken to. And they've told me the, the, the other pains and frustrations, the up and down and folly and undercrowns they went through, trying to understand not just the Bible that they was reading, but trying to reconcile things they were reading with a lot of the counterfeit Christian mythos, the, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant mythos. Right? The white, that, but that's what sort of mythos it is. Right, that that the majority of us are facing, and that is like such a wall. Right, this is why we go through these kind of studies and seek to break down the words, because one might not get everything, but at least they will hopefully get part of a system that they can at least find whether the translation is really bringing across the true sense, because we've heard a lot of pastors preach on verses and come to a conclusion in this verse, and it doesn't even make sense when you understand basic reading comprehension. And then as pastors and preachers, I would have expected that the pastor and the preacher, since they are pastor and the preacher, there's more of a requirement on them. Now, this is not us judging or condemning pastors or preachers of the past. That, that's not our, you know, role and responsibility, you know, now or and maybe not in the future, you know. There, there's another that can deal with that right there. We're just pointing out a principle that there are those that were supposed to be instructors. Well, what we have in Paul, when we're looking at the epistles, is one really taking that responsibility to give that instruction, 
right? But give that instruction because he was instructed. See, see why Paul is such an important part. And I know there's ones and ones even is um, heal up to uh, honorable priest Isaac. We could reason on that on Paul. He mentioned Paul how many of us have had different feelings or vibes or whatever about Paul in the Bible. Right, but do you do we really know the real Paul? Right, if you saw the Pauline, you know, gospel, and they say, well, Paul was a, a false apostle, and we hear about all these sort of things. And some of that is true according to the counterfeit Christian context, you see, because most of them ha was not initiated, right, into the Hebrew, right, when we say the, when we say the Hebrew mysteries, let's put it more directly, right, the Yehudi messianic m mysteries, the, or the Jewish messianic. When I say Jewish, I don't want it to go off over there, but to keep it with Robeno, Yeshua HaMoshiach, right? That's why we mentioned Matthew chapter 13. That's where he's initiating the Talmudim. And notice what he says. If you read chapter 13 in, in Matthew, even just the first part of it, you'll see that Yeshua, he goes and he's speaking parables to the multitude. What's a parable? A parable is like a proverb. A parable is somewhat like an allegory. It's not quite, but it's similar in some senses to an allegory, right? Basically, a parable is a muthos, a mythos. A parable is a mythos, right? But it's a mythos in the true narrative sense, right? And this is what he breaks down and he builds on. So even in the scripture, right, there are the mythos, the true mythos lead to the revelation of the true mystery and the mysteries right those secret those confidential you know those truths that hide in plain sight but because of how we are socialized to see things right we, we we're seeing them with eyes wide shut we're not perceiving them you know what i mean we're not perceiving them I mean, they're there, you know what I mean? You know, the, the truth is there. It's almost like opening your eyes and seeing the very same reality, but now you're seeing the reality like in living color, like like 10, you know, what do you say, 1080, you know, um, high definition, right? So here, the word mueo, right? Getting to the, the G3453, here's the key, to initiate into the mysteries, right? It says to teach fully. You see that right there? To teach fully. Right? Even Robeno says that. Right? When he speaks about, you know, the Talmudim. Like that a Talmud is not above Rebbo. Not above his rabbi. But it's enough that when he's fully instructed, he is as his rabbi. He is as his master. Right? So the whole purpose, right, of that discipleship. My is to attain that level of when we say mastery, my of the living mystery, my and be that exemplar, that example of the truth, my as his master says to fulfill, my you know to fulfill the ten words, my and to be perfect, my in spirit and in truth as our Father, as Elohim, our source, my so to teach fully, to instruct, a to accustom one to a thing. To give one an intimate acquaintance. You see what it says, intimate? You know, when we use this term, it's kind of interesting the word knowledge and to know from a Hebrew perspective. This is not the point here, but I'm, maybe I'll just leave the eye with this. From a Hebrew perspective, we look in the Bible, even the translation, start out with the KJV translation. The first place we have for to know it's about knowing like the whole tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then the next example we have to know, from what we recall, is how Adam, right, Atum, Atam, right, Adam, how he knew Eshito, Esheto, or Seto, his wife, Hawa, Eva, right, Zoe, one can say, right, and how she conceived and she brought forth Kai and Cain, right, then afterward, like he know, they, know her again, and then Abel, Hebel. Right? We can say the Hebrew or siren. Right? It's interesting, right? That we have the word know both being used in a kind of a cognitive sense. We could say maybe like a mental, you know, head sense, even that sense of the upper, right? And then we have it in the secondary sense, like a man know his wife, that intimacy. So I'm pointing out the word intimate 
in dealing with knowledge and instruction, right? It's not that you just heard about something. Like sometimes people say, yeah, the Bible says such and such. Uh, and, and they'll say, doesn't it? Uh, I heard that in the Bible. And now I get into more of the discipline. I'm like, where does it say that? And I'm trying just to remind ones, and even just openly here, if there's an area of scripture that try to even memorize the verse or even the book it's in, right? Because it's important to have that point of reference because sometimes we have a problem with something in the scripture and we have an, we're not even able to quote the translation that we read, right? See, see, meditation is not just, meditation is committing something to the mind, right? So even as we read the scripts, you know, committing the verses to our mind and thinking about these things, meditating on it, right? Because this is how we become intimate and acquaintance. See, that acquaintance is that gnosis, that da'at, is that scientia, that scientia, is that, is that knowledge. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, right? So right here, we have Strong's definition, bringing it right here from the base of the G3466 to initiate. So you see how the word initiate is connected with the mysteries and how mysteries, myth stories is connected with muth or mythos. You know what I'm saying? And then how we have a positive sense of it, right? A true narrative, but then also we can have a fictitious narrative. Like for example, Yeshua HaMoshiach, our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, Yeshua being a black man, reality, that is the true narrative. He looking like Kaiser Borgia, like Caesar Borgia, you know, that whitewashed Kaiser Borgia, right? Roman Renaissance, that is the false narrative. That's the pseudo. You see what I'm saying? And there's two different lines of that, right? I'm, I just use that as a visual. That's a kind of a visual image because we need to get beyond just the, I think it's a, a manifest fact that they whitewash and sought to cover up the truth of it like they do with ancient Egypt too try to divorce black and so-called African and Negro people from that. You know what I mean? Like they try to divorce the Hebrew and we as Beta Israel from that too. But here we have initiate. So here's the key right here. Now, now look at that. Look, look what we just did. It says this word mueo, once again, mu mueo, right, which means to initiate, which is at the root of myth, mythos. You see what I'm saying? Because see, even a lot of those so-called fables, within the proper order of initiation there are some fables that are used right as object lesson stories right you know object lesson stories so you can assess you could say the the inner eye right that first eye of one and that perception right that knowledge so-called like that knowledge of the heart that heart to cool knowledge like how deep how much to the center of the thing can they get based on their reaction right, to the reasonings. Like me and the brother reason on something and we're reasoning on it in the non-Rastafari way. And there's another brother who's a Rastafari. Right? And he hears reason on that. Now if he join us in that, now we might just be reasoned that way just to see we want him to rebuke us, but he doesn't rebuke us. See, one who's initiated would rebuke you because you'll see something's wrong with that. And because the brotherhood, you, you know, see the whole different principle. But when one is not initiated in that, and this is a, a case we can kind of trace this to Rastafari, you know, in the present time. There needs to be more of that initiation, that teaching. Give us the teaching, that initiation, right? Um, musterion, musterion. So that comes from the word musterion. And look what musterion is. This is the word in the Koine Greek for mystery. That's why when they try to say that what well, has a pre-Greek root, right? Bikis earlier on etym online, yes, and that's the Hebrew, mistatir. Right? We'll go to Yeshaya. In Yeshaya we have that word mistatir from Satar. Here, borrowed into the Koine Greek from the Hebrew, we have Musterion. Musterion is a hidden, right, a hidden thing. So that's hidden. Right? It's like pi and phi. Right? You know about pi and phi? Right? Pi and phi. Once you begin to know about it and recognize, you can be, once your eyes are open to see it, you begin to see it everywhere. 
but until you initiate it to see it, you don't see it anywhere. It, it's 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 a secret. It's hiding in plain sight, right? A hidden thing, a secret, a mystery. Generally, mysteries or religious, you know, secrets confided only to the initiated and not to ordinary mortals. This is what we have being narrated in Matthew chapter 13. When the disciples ask Yeshua, they say, why are you speaking to them in parables? And Yeshua says he speaks to them in parables, a type of what you would call mythos, right? M mythological uh, analogous, uh, analogous narratives, right? Because they kind of, you know, seeing, see, hearing, hear, but they don't really get it. But to you, he says, the disciples, because they're in that discipline, right? That discipline of mind, will he reveal the, the mysteries, that, that which is hidden, the secret thing. Not the thing that's not so obvious to the casual, right, understanding, right, the hidden purpose or, or counsel, the secret will, right, of both men and the Elohim, the secret counsels that govern Elohim in dealing with the righteous, which are hidden from the ungodly. The ungodly don't understand these things. That's why I said, why is myth, you know, why is the Bible a myth to the many, right? That which is what hidden. When I say the ungodly and the and the wicked man, see people. Well, as soon as people hear ungodly and wicked men, the first thing people begin to see it within this white Anglo-Saxon Protestant caricature. When we start to look at it from the Hebrew perspective, right, we get a better context, right, of what it means by like the ungodly, right, and even a righteous man if he swerved from his righteousness momentarily then momentarily he's ungodly, momentarily he's defiant. You see what I'm saying? But which are hidden from, generally speaking, the ungodly, the unjah-like, and the ratchet man, right? the defiant man. But it's plain to the Hasidim, right? It's plain to, now in rabbinic writings, listen to this, it denotes the hidden, the mystic or the hidden sense. So that's why we keep calling Yeshua, Robeinu, I and I, Rabbi. I, our black Lord and Savior, Shuha Moshiach, because he is our rabbi. And when we talk about the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John specifically, right? We're talking about the mystic and the hidden sense of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those pillars there, those four, right? Also of Old Testament sayings of an image or, see, or form seen in a vision or a dream, right? Now, notice what it says right here the origin of. Um, musterion for mystery is derivative of muo, which means to shut the mouth. Right? To shut the mouth. Right? What, what do you mean by shut the mouth? Well, it's a twofold sense of shutting the mouth. Shutting the mouth, first of all, to receive, to initiate, to receive, the Talmud to receive, and then, then also shutting the mouth to perceive, to meditate on it. You know, because sometimes people read something in the Bible. And they're quick to go with their subjective misunderstanding, right? And in a sense, right, ones do it to themselves because of lack of discipline. But overall, counterfeit Christianity has done it to them, right? Because they established this kind of Babylon, this confusion, right? By not even going there, you know what I mean? To explain these things better so ones can understand. Look at this. Strong's definition from a derivative of muo. Right, muo, which means to shut the mouth, a secret or a quote mystery, right? Mistatia, one of Elohim's, one of Moshe's confidentials, through the idea of silence imposed by initiation, it says, into religious rites, right? Or into the Nazarene, the Nazarene rites, right? The true Nazarene rites that later on, right, would be more and more counterfeited and called. Christianity, especially in the counterfeit Western Gentile Christianity. But now, here we get to the very root of it, right? The very root of this idea. So it's about a certain being taught, being guided, right? You know, because if you just read the King James Version of the Bible and you believe what you think the translator is translated there and you don't study, right? You're not really studying the real scripture, but you're studying like a carbon copy of the scripture, which could be through proper discipline, right? It could be through proper discipline, a stepping stone. But without proper discipline, it becomes a stumbling block. 
and this is the main reason why we have said you know why the bible is a myth why why bible is a myth to the many right first of all because counterfeit christianity created this counterfeit mythology right the times really in the fullest sense the times of the gentiles right the times of the gentiles the nation states have created this right and other people who were not acquainted right you know who were not acquainted with we could say the the spiritual and the esoteric aspects i mean people talk about that now and new ages and so forth and so on but still many of them are not really studying it from the true initiation Right? The true initiation means if we're going to look at the Hebrew scripture, we got to go into the Hebrew. If we're going to be into the Brit Chadasha, like the New Testament, renewed covenant scripture, we definitely have to go into the coin of Greek, as well as the Hebrew. Yes, there's the Hebrew of the New Testament, but definitely go to the coin of Greek. That means we have to get to the, the root meanings of the words in the context. Right? And when we find alternative readings of certain areas of the scripture, this is where that muo, muo, that, that shutting of the mouth, that meditating, that, that being still, right? that being still. So anyway, brothers and sisters, shalom, chabarim, shalom. This is Ras Ayadonis Tafari. This is Yad in here, L-O-J-S, the Lion of Judah Society, L-O-J-S dot O-R-G. Join us on the air for the evening podcast. Rastafari Israelites on the YouTube as well as the, the podcast on the air and the irate yes, SI Rastafari. So yes, anyway, brothers and sisters, um, I hope this is helpful. Right? Myth like most words in the true objective sense, most words are double edged swords. Right? Most words have a duality to it. So yes. The Bible is a, a myth to the many, but there's a reason why it's a myth within the untrue, the fictional, or even the make-believe. You know, like Christianity become make-believe because they inserted things like Santa Claus, for example, right? More people know about Santa Claus than so-called Saint Nick, right? They've inserted, you know, the Easter egg and bunny rabbit, right, over the resurrection, you know, the death, burial, and resurrection, right, of the Lord and Savior, according to their own profess, what you call. It. You see, so they kind of say one thing and do another, right? And this is one reason why that right there is an example, right, of that myth. And therefore, it's also an opiate, right? Because then when you know the truth, Right, about the scripture and the true application of the word it leads you into ways of reality right you don't have time for that fantasy because you recognize the difference between you know the letter of the law right and the spirit of ha torah shalom chabarim shalom lehitarot